Charleston, South Carolina. Table of Contents, Charleston. All about Charleston. With visiting and touring information. Geography. History. Attractions. And other points of interest. Dr. Sidney Socloff. Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com. 2022. Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Cole Tove. For a more complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to this video using the link here. Chapter 1 Introduction to Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina. This is the Palmetto, the state tree of South Carolina. This is the South Carolina state flag. Charleston is a city in Charleston County in South Carolina, located just south of the midpoint of South Carolina's coastline. Charleston is in the center of the coastal region of South Carolina, called the Low Country, because of its low elevation above sea level. The upstate or northwestern corner of South Carolina is in the Blue Ridge Mountains, part of the Appalachian Mountain chain that runs from Maine to northern Georgia. The capital of the state is Columbia. To the north of Charleston near North Carolina is the resort area of Myrtle Beach. And to the south are Georgetown and Hilton Head Island. Charleston is the largest city and county seat of Charleston County. Note on the city seal it says Carolopolis equals Latin for the city of Charles. This is a map of the area around Charleston at the confluence of the Cooper and Ashley Rivers. Charleston is on a narrow peninsula at the confluence of the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. The old city is located on a peninsula at the point where, as Charlestonians say, the Ashley and the Cooper Rivers come together to form the Atlantic Ocean. The entire peninsula is very low. Some of it is landfill material, and as such, it frequently floods during heavy rains, storm surges, and unusually high tides. The old city is located on a peninsula at the point where, as Charlestonians say, the Ashley and the Cooper Rivers come together to form the Atlantic Ocean. The entire peninsula is very low. Some of it is landfill material, and as such, it frequently floods during heavy rains, storm surges, and unusually high tides. The city limits have expanded across the Ashley River from the peninsula encompassing the majority of West Ashley, as well as James Island. The city limits also have expanded across the Cooper River encompassing Daniel Island. North Charleston blocks any expansion up the peninsula and has a population roughly the same as Charlestown. Mount Pleasant occupies the land directly east of the Cooper River. Charleston has a large and well-protected harbor. Charleston is on a narrow peninsula at the confluence of the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. This again shows Charleston at the confluence of the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie were built to guard the harbor in the days after the War of 1812. Charleston has a population of 120,000, making it the second most populous city in South Carolina close behind the state capital Columbia. The Charleston-North Charleston-Somerville Metropolitan Statistical Area consists of three counties, Charleston, Berkeley, and Dorchester and has a total population of about 605,000. North Charleston is nearly as large as the city of Charleston and ranks as the third largest city in the state. Mount Pleasant and Somerville are the next largest cities. Chapter 2 
History of Charleston After Charles II of England, Scotland, and Ireland, 1630 to 1685, was restored to the British throne following Oliver Cromwell's protectorate. He granted the Charter of Carolina Territory to eight of his loyal friends. Known as the Lords Proprietors In 1663 It took seven years before the Lords could arrange for settlement. The first being that of Charlestown. Charleston's name is derived from Charlestown. Named after King Charles II of England. The name was later changed to Charleston in 1783 after the Revolutionary War. The eight Lords Proprietors were given the lands between the latitudes of 31 and 36 degrees and from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans. In 1665, this was extended slightly to go from 29 degrees to 36 degrees and 30 minutes north. The Lords Proprietors, while their authority was granted by royal charter, were nonetheless able to exercise that authority with nearly the power of an independent sovereign. The community was established by English settlers in 1670 on the west bank of the Ashley River, a few miles northwest of the present city. It was soon chosen by Anthony Ashley Cooper, one of the Lord's proprietors, to become a great port town, a destiny which the city fulfilled. By 1680, the settlement had grown, joined by other settlers from England, Barbados, and Virginia, and relocated to its current peninsular location. Charlestown was the capital of the Carolina colony and the center for further expansion. It was the southernmost point of English settlement during the late 1600s. The large area encompassed by the colony of Carolina, and the lack of good transportation across this region, where the rivers ran from west to east made unified governance very difficult. As a result, in 1729 the colony of Carolina was split into the colonies of North and South Carolina. The settlement was often subject to attack from sea and land. Periodic assaults from Spain and France, who still contested England's claims to the region, were combined with resistance from Native Americans, as well as pirate raids. Charleston's colonists erected a fortification wall around the small settlement to aid in its defense. Two buildings remain from the walled city. The Powder Magazine, where the city's supply of gunpowder was stored in the Pink House, believed to have been an old colonial tavern. The Old Powder Magazine in Charleston is the oldest public building in South Carolina. It dates from the period 1703 to 1713, and is the only public building to have survived the Charleston Wall. The old powder magazine was used as a powder magazine until after the revolution. The walls of the powder magazine are quite thick, but the roof, in comparison, is somewhat thinner. That's because if the building were ever to explode it would fly upwards, not outwards. As it has never blown up, we are forced to accept that this is true. It is now a museum open for tours. A 1680 plan for the new settlement, the Grand Modale, laid out of the model of an exact regular town, and the future for the growing community. The land surrounding the intersection of Meeting and Broad Streets was set aside for a civic square. Over time it became known as the Four Corners of the Law referring to the various arms of governmental and religious law presiding over the square and the growing city. In 1681, the capital of the Carolina colony was erected across the square. Because of its prominent position within the city and its elegant architecture, the Capitol building signaled to Charleston citizens and visitors its importance within the British colonies. 
The provincial court met on the ground floor. The Commons House of Assembly and the Royal Governor's Council Chamber met on the second floor. While the earliest settlers primarily came from England, Colonial Charleston was also home to a mixture of ethnic and religious groups in colonial times. Boston, Massachusetts, and Charleston were sister cities, and people of means spent summers in Boston and winters in Charleston. There was a great deal of trade with Bermuda and the Caribbean, and some people came to live in Charleston from these areas. French, Scottish, Irish, and Germans migrated to the developing seacoast town, representing numerous Protestant denominations, as well as Roman Catholicism and Judaism. There was a great deal of trade with Bermuda and the Caribbean, and some people came to live in Charleston from these areas. French, Scottish, Irish, and Germans migrated to the developing seacoast town, representing numerous Protestant denominations, as well as Roman Catholicism and Judaism. Slaves also comprised a major portion of the population and were active in the city's religious community. The Emmanuel A.M.E. Church stems from a religious group organized solely by African Americans, free and slave, in 1791. It is the oldest A.M.E. Church in the South and the second oldest A.M.E. Church in the country. Slaves also comprised a major portion of the population and were active in the city's religious community. The Emanuel A.M.E. Church stems from a religious group organized solely by African Americans, free and slave, in 1791. It is the oldest A.M.E. Church in the South and the second oldest A.M.E. Church in the country. Free black Charlestonians and slaves also helped establish the old Bethel United Methodist Church in 1797. From the mid-18th century, a large amount of immigration was taking place in the upcountry of the Carolinas, some of it coming from abroad through Charleston, but also much of it a southward movement from Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, until the upcountry population was larger than the coastal population. The upcountry people were viewed by Charlestonians as being unpolished in many ways and had different interests, setting the stage for several generations of conflicts between the upcountry and the Charleston elite. By the mid-18th century, Charleston had become a bustling trade center, the hub of the Atlantic trade for the southern colonies, and the wealthiest and largest city south of Philadelphia. By 1770, Charleston was the fourth largest port in the colonies, after only Boston, New York and Philadelphia, with a population of 11,000, slightly more than half of that slaves. Rice and indigo had been successfully cultivated by slave-owning planters in the surrounding coastal low country. Those in naval stores were exported in an extremely profitable shipping industry. It was the cultural and economic center of the South in 1800 Charleston was still in fifth place. Although Charleston dropped out of the top five, it remained among the ten largest cities in the United States through the 1840 census. As the relationship between the colonists and England deteriorated, Charleston became a focal point in the ensuing American Revolution. In protest of the Tea Act of 1773, which embodied the concept of taxation without representation, Charlestonians confiscated tea and stored it in the Exchange and Custom House. Representatives from all over the colony came to the Exchange in 1774 to elect delegates to the Continental Congress, the group responsible for drafting the Declaration of Independence and South Carolina declared its independence from the crown on the steps of the exchange. Soon, 
the church steeples of Charleston, especially St. Michael's, became targets for British warships, causing rebel forces to paint the steeples black to blend with the night sky. Charleston was twice the target of British attacks. At every stage, the British strategy assumed a large base of loyalist supporters who would rally to the king given some military support. On June 28, 1776, General Henry Clinton with 2,000 men and a naval squadron tried to seize Charleston, hoping for a simultaneous loyalist uprising in South Carolina. This attack failed as the naval force was defeated by the Continental Army. The 2nd South Carolina Regiment at Fort Moultrie under the command of William Moultrie. When the fleet fired cannonballs, the explosives failed to penetrate the forts unfinished, yet thick palmetto log walls. Additionally, no local loyalists attacked the town from behind as the British had hoped. The Loyalists were too poorly organized to be effective, but as late as 1780 senior officials in London, misled by Loyalist exiles, placed their confidence in their rising. Clinton returned in 1780 with 14,000 soldiers. American General Benjamin Lincoln was trapped and surrendered his entire 5,400 men force after a long fight. The Siege of Charleston was the greatest American defeat of the war. Several Americans escaped the carnage and joined up with several militias, including those of Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, and Andrew Pickens. These militias used hit-and-run tactics. Eventually, Clinton returned to New York leaving Charles Cornwallis with 8,000 redcoats to rally loyalists, build forts across the state, and demand oaths of allegiance to the king. Many of these forts we taken over by the outnumbered guerrilla militias. The British retained control of the city until December 1782. After the British left, the city's name was officially changed to Charleston in 1783. By 1792, the capital had been rebuilt and became the Charleston County Courthouse. Upon its completion, the city possessed all the public buildings necessary to be transformed from a colonial capital to the center of the antebellum south. The grandeur and number of buildings erected in the following century reflect the optimism, pride, and civic destiny that many Charlestonians felt for the community. The grandeur and number of buildings erected in the following century reflect the optimism, pride, and civic destiny that many Charlestonians felt for their community. As Charleston grew, so did the community's cultural and social opportunities, especially for the elite merchants and planters. The first theater building in America was built in Charleston in 1736, but was later replaced by the 19th century planters hotel where wealthy planters stayed during Charleston's horse racing season. It is now the Dock Street Theatre, known as one of the oldest active theatres built for stage performance in the United States. Charleston became more prosperous in the plantation-dominated economy of the post-revolutionary years. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 revolutionized this crop's production, and it quickly became South Carolina's major export. Cotton plantations relied heavily on slave labor. Slaves were also the primary labor force within the city, working as domestics, artisans, market workers or laborers. In 1807, the Charleston market was founded. It soon became a hub for the African American community, with many slaves and free black staffing stalls. Many black Charlestonians spoke Ella, 
a language based on African-American structures that combined African, French, German, Jamaican, English, Bahamian, and Dutch words. Pre-Civil War Political Changes in the First Half of the 19th Century South Carolinians became more devoted to the idea that states' rights were superior to the federal government's authority. Buildings such as the Marine Hospital ignited controversy over the degree to which the federal government should be involved in South Carolina's government, society, and commerce. During this period over 90% of federal funding was generated from import duties, collected by custom houses such as the one in Charleston. Chapter 3 Charleston in the Civil War In 1832, South Carolina passed an Ordinance of Nullification, a procedure in which a state could in effect repeal a federal law directed against the most recent tariff acts. Soon federal soldiers we dispensed to Charleston's forts and began to collect tariffs by force. A compromise was reached by which the tariffs would be gradually reduced. But the underlying argument of the state's rights would continue to escalate in the coming decades. Charleston remained one of the busiest port cities in the country, and the construction of the new, larger United States Custom House began in 1849, but its construction was interrupted by the events of their Civil War. The American Civil War On December 20, 1860, the South Carolina General Assembly made the state the first to ever secede from the Union. The mark the beginnings of the American Civil War, or as it was known in the South, the war between the states. This is a newspaper headline announcing the secession of South Carolina from the Union. The secession of South Carolina from the Union, December 20, 1860. On January 9, 1861, Citadel cadets fired the first shots of the American Civil War when they opened fire on the Union ship Star of the West entering Charleston's harbor. A leaf from the January 26, 1861 edition of Harper's Weekly shows Charleston just before the Civil War. The illustration includes images of Broad Street, the Mercury Office, the Custom House, Castle Pinckney, Fort Sumter, and Fort Moultrie. On April 12, 1861, shore batteries under the command of General Pierre G. T. Beauregard opened fire on the Union-held Fort Sumter in the harbor. After a 34-hour bombardment, Major Robert Anderson surrendered the fort. Officers and cadets from the Citadel were assigned to various Confederate batteries during the bombardment of Fort Sumter. Although the Citadel continued to operate as an academy during the Civil War, cadets were made a part of the South Carolina Military Department along with the cadets from the Arsenal Academy in Columbia to form a battalion of state cadets. Cadets from both institutions continued to aid the Confederate Army by helping drill recruits, manufacture ammunition, protect arms depots, and guard Union prisoners. We will next have a short video clip on the Confederate account of Fort Sumter. We will next have a short video clip on the Confederate account of Fort Sumter.
Oyster Creek Battery, Morris Island, April 14, 1861. Dear Harold, The movements on our island during the early part of last week afforded unmistakable evidence of the coming storm. It only required the appearance of reinforcements as a signal to strike the blow. Vessels of war were seen outside our bar on Thursday night, and the final demand for our fort, so long looked for, came at last. At the dawn of day on Friday morning, the 12th instant, the cannonade commenced and continued on our part until half past one Saturday. Major Anderson's batteries remained silent for some time before answering those of ours. But when they opened, it was with such rapidity that we were induced to believe that his force was larger than reported. His batteries played actively on our own until about half past eight o'clock Saturday morning, when the houses inside the fort caught fire from one of our red-hot shot and continued to burn until about half past one, when his white flag appeared announcing a surrender. The flag staff of Sumter was shot down, or came down by some other means just previous to the surrender. Not a life on our side was lost. This is owing to the fact that Major Anderson had no shell, or if he had, couldn't use them. Our iron battery and Fort Moultrie did the work. Major Anderson's large shot were thrown away when striking those iron bars. We have not ascertained the loss in Fort Sumter. General Beauregard deserves great credit for his masterly plan of attack. It has saved many lives to our country. We have four cannon at our battery, but never got to fire a gun, the enemy not daring to approach. I could sit on my cannon and see every battery firing on the fort, as well as Fort Sumter itself, and also the ships of war with which we were expected to engage. Our detachment was commanded by Lieutenant Lithgow. We kept our muskets to use in case of a close hand-to-hand -hand conflict. I like the artillery service the best. The cannon and rifle are the most approved weapons of warfare, and the musket will have to yield the palm to them. The rifle cannon was used but little during this engagement in consequence of a scarcity of the proper kind of ball. It fired with great precision. Fort Sumter is ours at last. Our mission is ended and with it closes my correspondence with the Lawrenceville Herald for the present. Conscious that the importance of the events transpiring in our harbor is all that has rendered my letters interesting to your readers, I bid them adieu. Yours truly, B. This is Charleston after the Civil War. This is another view of Charleston after the Civil War. This is another view of Charleston after the Civil War. Chapter 4 Reconstruction Era After the defeat of the Confederacy, federal forces remained in Charleston during the city's reconstruction. The war had shattered the prosperity of the antebellum city. Freed slaves were faced with poverty and discrimination. Industries slowly brought the city and its inhabitants back to a renewed vitality and growth in population. As the city's commerce improved, Charlestonians also worked to restore their community institutions. This is the Confederate Memorial at White Point Gardens. On August 31, 1886, Charleston was nearly destroyed by an earthquake measuring 7.5 on the Richter scale. Major damage was reported as far away as Tybee Island, Georgia, over 60 miles away, and structural damage was reported several hundred miles from Charleston, including central Alabama, central Ohio, eastern Kentucky, southern Virginia, and western West Virginia. The earthquake was felt as far away as Boston to the north, Chicago, and Milwaukee to the northwest, as far west as New Orleans as far south as Cuba, and as far east as Bermuda. The earthquake damaged 2,000 buildings in Charleston and caused $6 million worth of damage. $187 million in 2022 U.S. dollars. While in the whole city the buildings were only valued at approximately $24 million, $747 million in 2022 U.S. dollars. Hurricane Hugo hit Charleston in 1989. And though the worst damage was in nearby McClellanville, 
the storm damaged three-quarters of the homes in Charleston's historic district. The hurricane caused over $2.8 billion in damage. This is the path of Hurricane Hugo in 1989. Chapter 5 Charleston Today Charleston is a major tourist destination, with a considerable number of luxury hotels, hotel chains, inns, bed and breakfasts, and a large number of award-winning restaurants and quality shopping. Charleston is well known for its streets lined with grand live oaks draped with Spanish moss, and the ubiquity of the cabbage palmetto, which is the state tree of South Carolina. Along the waterfront in an area known as Rainbow Row are many beautiful and historic pastel-colored homes. Charleston is an important port, having the second-largest container seaport on the East Coast and the fourth-largest container seaport in North America. Charleston is becoming a prime location for information technology jobs and corporations, most notably Blackboard, Modulant, CSS, Benefit Ficus, and Google. The aerospace industry is beginning to establish itself with the joint venture plants of Watt and Alenia Aeronautica, where two of the five sections of the Boeing 787 fuselage are fabricated and assembled. Charleston is the primary medical center for the eastern portion of the state. The city has several major hospitals located in the downtown area alone. Medical University of South Carolina Medical Center, MUSC, Ralph H. Johnson VA Medical Center, and Roper Hospital. The Medical University of South Carolina is the state's first school of medicine, the largest medical university in the state, and the sixth oldest continually operating school of medicine in the United States. The Medical University of South Carolina, chartered in 1824, is situated on a 45-acre complex and consists of six colleges and seven hospitals, one of which is the Medical University Hospital. The Medical University of South Carolina is the largest employer in the city limits. The Medical University of South Carolina, chartered in 1824, is situated on a 45-acre complex and consists of six colleges and seven hospitals, one of which is the Medical University Hospital. The Medical University of South Carolina is the largest employer in the city limits. The downtown medical district is experiencing rapid growth of biotechnology and medical research industries, coupled with substantial expansions of all of the major hospitals. Additionally, more expansions are planned or underway at several other major hospitals located in other portions of the city and the metropolitan area, Bon Secours St. Francis Xavier Hospital, Trident Medical Center, and East Cooper Regional Medical Center. Founded in 1842 the Citadel has an undergraduate student body of about 2,000 students who make up the South Carolina Corps of Cadets. The Citadel is best known nationally for its Corps of Cadets, which draws students from about 40 states and a dozen countries. The Citadel is best known nationally for its Corps of Cadets, which draws students from about 40 states and a dozen countries. The men and women in the Corps live and study under a classical military system that makes leadership and character training an essential part of the educational experience. About a third of the graduating classes accept military commissions. The Citadel is divided into five academic schools, business, education, engineering, humanities and social sciences, and science and mathematics. 
because of its focus on teaching, a high graduation rate and strong alumni support. The Citadel ranks highly in the annual U.S. News & World Report ratings of Southern colleges that offer at least a master's degree. Another 1,000 students attend the Citadel Graduate College, a civilian evening program that offers graduate and professional as well as undergraduate programs. The racial-slash-ethnic makeup of Charleston is 65.2%. White Americans, 31.6%, Black Americans, 1.6%, Asian Americans, and 2.4%, Hispanics or Latino who may be of any race. Chapter 6 Charleston boasts many historic buildings, art and historical museums, and other attractions. In 1931, Charleston passed the first historic district zoning ordinance in the country to preserve its architectural heritage. Charleston's historic district has more than 2,000 buildings. Since it was founded in 1670, Charleston has done an outstanding job of preserving its past. It has 73 pre-revolutionary structures. 136 from the late 18th century, and more than 600 others built before 1840. There's a delightful story told about a wealthy Charleston matron that was asked why she never used her money to travel. She answered, But my dear, why should I travel when I'm already here? Charleston named number two top American destination. For the 17th consecutive year, readers of Condé Nast Traveler magazine designated Charleston a top 10 travel destination in the U.S. This ranking maintains Charleston's spot as the number one East Coast destination. America's most published etiquette expert, Marjorie Young Stewart recognized Charleston 1995 as the best-mannered city in the U.S. A claim lent credibility by the fact that it has the first established livability court in the country. A livability court is a municipal court, or court of limited jurisdiction, focused on cases involving non-compliance with codes and standards about housing, waste, the environment, noise, animal control, zoning, traffic, and tourism. Charleston is known as the Holy City due to the prominence of churches on the lower rise cityscape, and particularly the numerous steeples which dot the city skyline, and for the fact that it was one of the few cities in the original 13 colonies to provide religious tolerance to the French Huguenot Church in fact. It is still the only city in the U.S. with such church. Charleston has over 400 places of worship of many different denominations throughout the city, and religion is deeply embedded in the city's rich culture. This concentration of historic churches and denominations dates to the unique guarantees of religious freedom written into the original colony's constitution back in 1670 by the great English philosopher John Locke. As a result, many oppressed beliefs found a safe haven in Charleston, and the city became a melting pot for the Congregationalist, Unitarian, Quaker, Baptist, Catholic, Jewish, Presbyterian, Anglican, African Methodist Episcopal, and Lutheran. The First Anglican Church, St. Philip's Episcopal Church, was built in 1682, although later destroyed by fire and relocated to its current location. St. Michael's Episcopal Church, Charleston's oldest and most noted church, was built in 1752. This shows the location of St. Philip's Episcopal Church and St. Michael's Episcopal Church. 
Charleston was also one of the first colonial cities to allow Jews to practice their faith without restriction. Congregation Beth Elohim Founded in 1749 Is the fourth oldest Jewish congregation in the continental United States. This shows the location of the congregation Beth Elohim Synagogue. Sephardic Jews migrated to the city in such numbers that by the beginning of the 19th century, and until about 1830, Charleston was home to the largest and wealthiest Jewish community in North America. Sephardic Jews migrated to the city in such numbers that by the beginning of the 19th century, and until about 1830, Charleston was home to the largest and wealthiest Jewish community in North America. The Jewish Coming Street Cemetery, first established in 1762, attests to their long-standing presence in the community. Brith Shalom Beth Israel is the oldest Orthodox synagogue in the South. Founded by Ashkenazi, German and Central European, Jews in the mid-19th century. This shows the location of the Brith Shalom, Beth Israel Synagogue. Charleston Harbor Tour is the longest-running harbor tour company in Charleston, serving its guests since 1908. The Harbor of History too lasts 90 minutes and is a non-stop. Fascinating. Live narrated Harbor Cruise. Featuring 75 Charleston attractions spanning almost 20 miles. The Charleston Harbor Cruise is considered by many to be the most popular attraction in Charleston. Once aboard, you will experience Charleston from a different viewpoint. Every fort in Charleston's harbor is included on this trip. Fort Sumter, Fort Mowell Tree, and Fort Johnson. This shows the location of the various points of interest in Charleston. This shows the location of these points of interest in Charleston. This shows the location of these points of interest in Charleston. This shows the location of these points of interest in Charleston. Battery Park, also known as the Battery, which includes a park known as White Point Gardens is a landmark promenade in Charleston famous for its stately antebellum homes. These are homes along the Battery. This is a view of the waterfront Battery Park, including White Point Gardens. This is a map showing Battery Park and White Point Gardens. This again shows the waterfront Battery Park and White Point Gardens. First used as a public park in 1837, Battery Park became a place for artillery during the American Civil War. Battery Park stretches along the shores of the Charleston Peninsula, bordered by the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. Fort Sumter is visible from the Cooper River side and the point. Also visible from the point is Castle Pinckney, the World War II aircraft carrier USS Yorktown, Fort Maltry, and Sullivan's Island. In the 18th century, rocks and heavy materials we used to fortify the show of the Copa Riva. In 1838, this area of the battery, known as High Battery, became a promenade. Before becoming a park, Fort Broughton, circa 1735, and Fort Wilkins, during the American Revolution and War of 1812, occupied White or Oyster Point, so named because of the piles of bleached oyster shells on the point. This site is now known as White Point Gardens and boasts many large oak trees, a bandstand, a few memorials, and pieces of artillery, some of which were used during the United States Civil War. 
A monument in White Point Gardens commemorates the hanging near that site of pirate Captain Steed Bonnet and his crew in 1718, as well as the 1719 hanging of Richard Worley's pirates. The monument states that 29 of Bonnet's crew were executed close by. Although 29 of Bonnet's crew were sentenced to death, the evidence suggests that only 22 were hanged. The Arthur Ravenel J.R. Bridge across the Cooper River opened in 2005 and is the longest cable stayed bridge in the Americas. The bridge links Mount Pleasant with downtown Charleston. The port of Charleston consists of five terminals. Three are on the harbor and the other two are on the Cooper River, just north of Charleston's bustling harbor. The Port of Charleston is ranked number one in customer satisfaction across North America by supply chain executives. Port activity, behind tourism, is the leading source of Charleston's revenue. Charleston's Museum Mile features the richest concentration of cultural sites open to visitors in downtown Charleston. Charleston's Museum Mile is a one-mile section of Meeting Street with six museums, five nationally important historic houses, four scenic parks, and a Revolutionary War powder magazine, as well as numerous historic houses of worship and public buildings including the Market and City Hall. Charleston's Museum Mile extends along Meeting Street from Mary Street a few blocks north of Calhoun Street down to a few blocks south of Broad Street. The main building of the museum is located on John and Meeting Street, across from the Charleston Visitor Center. The Charleston Museum was the first museum built in America, founded in 1773. It was established while South Carolina was yet a British colony. Inspired in part by the creation of the British Museum, 1759. The museum was established in 1773 by the Charleston Library Society and is commonly regarded as America's first museum. First opened to the public in 1824. The museum developed prominent collections declared in 1852 by Harvard scientist Louis Agassiz to be among the finest in America. Modern collecting emphases include natural science, ornithology, historical material culture, and both documentary and photographic resources. The Hayward Washington House is a historic house museum owned and operated by the Charleston Museum. Furnished for the late 18th century, the house includes a collection of Charleston-made furniture. The Joseph Manig Alt House is a historic house museum owned and operated by the Charleston Museum. The house was designed by Gabriel Manig Alt and is significant for its Adam-style architecture. The Market Hall and Sheds, also known simply as the Market, stretch several blocks behind 188 Meeting St. Market Hall was built in the 1830s and houses the Museum of the Confederacy. The Sheds house some permanent stores but are mainly occupied by open-air vendors. The Exchange and Provost Building was built in 1767. The building features a dungeon that held various signers of the Declaration of Independence and hosted events for George Washington in 1791 and the ratification of the U.S. Constitution in 1788. It is operated as a museum by the Daughters of the American Revolution. This shows the location of the market hall and sheds. This shows the location of the Exchange and Provost Building. The Jibs Museum of Art opened in 1905 and houses a premier collection of principally American works with a Charleston or Southern connection. This shows the location of the Jibs Museum of Art. 
This again shows the location of the Jibs Museum of Art. The Fireproof Building, also known as County Records Building, is located at 100 Meeting Saint. It was designed by Robert Mills and was completed by 1827. At that time, it was the most completely fireproof building in America, and it is believed to be the oldest fireproof building in America today. Currently, the Fireproof Building houses the South Carolina Historical Society, a membership-based reference library open to the public. The Nathaniel Russell House is an important federal-style house. It is owned by the historic Charleston Foundation and is open to the public as a house museum. This shows the location of the Nathaniel Russell House. The Governor William Aiken House, also known as the Aiken Red House, is a home built in 1820 for William Aiken, J.R. This shows the location of the Governor William Aiken House. Chapter 7 Fort Sumter Fort Sumter is a masonry coastal fortification located at the entrance to the harbor of Charleston. Fort Sumter is best known as the site upon which the shots initiating the American Civil War we fired at the Battle of Fort Sumter. This shows the location of Fort Sumter. This again shows the location of Fort Sumter. Fort Mowell Tree is on the opposite side of the harbor entrance. This again shows the location of Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie guarding the entrance to the harbor of Charleston. This is a view of Fort Sumter. The boat dock is a later addition. Named after General Thomas Sumter, Revolutionary War hero, Fort Sumter was built following the War of 1812 as one of a series of fortifications on the southern U.S. coast. Construction began in 1827, and the structure was still unfinished in 1860 when the conflict began. Fort Sumter was designed to house 650 men and 135 guns and three tires of gun emplacements, although it was never filled near its full capacities. 70,000 tons of granite were imported from New England to build up a sandbar in the entrance to Charleston Harbor, which the site dominates. The fort was a five-sided brick structure. 170 to 190 feet 58 meters long with walls 5 feet thick standing 50 feet 15 meters over the low tide mark on December 26 1860 five days after South Carolina declared its secession U.S. Army Major Robert Anderson abandoned the indefensible Fort Mowell Tree and secretly relocated companies of the 1st U.S. Artillery to Fort Sumter without orders from Washington on his own initiative. He thought that providing a stronger defense would delay an attack by the South Carolina militia. The force was not yet complete at the time, and few even half of the cannons that should have been available were not available due to military downsizing by President James Buchanan. Over the next few months, repeated calls for the United States evacuation of Fort Sumter from the government of South Carolina and later Confederate Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard were ignored. The United States attempts to resupply and reinforce the garrison we repulsed on January 9, 1861 when the first shots of the war prevented the steamer Star of the West, a ship hired by the Union to transport troops and supplies to Fort Sumter, from completing the task. After realizing that Anderson's command would run out of food by April 15, 1861, President Lincoln ordered a fleet of ships, under the command of Gustavus V. Fox, 
to attempt entry into Charleston Harbor and support Fort Sumter. By April 6, 1861, the first ships began to set sail for their round of U off the Charleston Bar. The first to arrive was the Harriet Lane. Before midnight of April 11, 1861. But that proved to be too late. On April 11, 1861 Beauregard sent three aides to demand the surrender of the fort. And Anderson declined. Beauregard sent the aides back to the fort and authorized Colonel James Chestnut. J.R. to decide whether the fort should be taken by force. The aides waited for hours while Anderson considered his alternatives and pled for time. At about 3 a.m., when Anderson finally announced his conditions, Colonel Chestnut left the fort and proceeded to the nearby Fort Johnson and gave the order to open fee on Fort Sumter. James Chestnut Junio, 1815 to 1885, was a United States Senator, a signatory of the Constitution of the Confederate States of America, and became a Confederate Army General. His wife was the well-known Mary Boykin Chestnut, whose diary reveals valuable observations of Southern life in the American Civil War. On April 12, 1861, at 4.30 a.m., Confederate batteries opened fire, firing for 34 straight hours, on the fort. The garrison of the fort returned fire, but it was ineffective, in part because Major Anderson did not use the guns mounted on the highest tier, the barbette tier where the gun detachments would be more exposed to Confederate fire. On April 13, the fort was surrendered and evacuated. No Union soldiers died in the actual battle though a Confederate soldier bled to death having been wounded by a misfiring cannon. One Union soldier died and another was mortally wounded during the 47th shot of a 100-shot salute allowed by the Confederacy. Afterward, the salute was shortened to 50 shots. Accounts, such as in the famous diary of Mary Chestnut, described Charleston residents along what is now known as the Battery, sitting on balconies and drinking salutes to the start of the hostilities. Atop a makeshift pole, the stars and bars of the Confederacy flies over Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Fort Sumter was held by the Confederacy until the end of the Civil War. The fort became a United States National Monument in 1948 and is managed by the National Park Service. Since Fort Sumter is located in the middle of Charleston Harbor, a trip by boat out to the island is required. Tours of the fort are available every day except New Year, Christmas, and Thanksgiving. The boat ride and tour of Fort Sumter costs $30 for adults. Boat service leaves from the Fort Sumter Visito Education Center at the Aquarium Wharf slash IMAX Complex in Charleston at 9.30 noon and 2.30. Boat service from Patriots Point in Mount Pleasant leaves at 10.45, 1.30, and 4 o'clock. The Fort Sumter Visitor Education Center, a new state-of-the-art and fully accessible facility located in downtown Charleston, is the primary ferry departure facility for visiting the fort. The Fort Sumter Visitor Education Center is located in Liberty Square at the eastern end of Calhoun Street on the Cooper River and adjacent to the South Carolina Aquarium. Before your ferry boat ride to the fort, take time in the Fort Sumter Visitor Education Center to explore the interpretive and visual exhibits.
National Park Service Rangers will answer questions and help you achieve a better understanding of the causes of the Civil War, why it began at Fort Sumter and what happened during the war. Inside Fort Sumter We will next have a short video clip on Fort Sumter. We will next have a short video clip on Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter is located at the harbor entrance of Charleston, South Carolina. The fort is named after the South Carolina Revolutionary War patriot Thomas Sumter. The building of Fort Sumter began in 1829. It is one in a series of coastal fortifications built by the United States after the War of 1812. The original fort walls were built five feet thick and stood a towering 50 feet above the waterline. In the early morning hours of April 12, 1861, Confederate cannons opened fire on the fort. The bombardment continued throughout the day and into the night. A cannon shot from Fort Maltry hit the officers' quarters and a large fire breaks out. On April 12, Union troops abandon the fort after a truce is agreed to. Victorious Confederate troops occupy the fort. Throughout the Civil War, Union ships will pound the fort with artillery fire. This bombardment continues to destroy the fort walls. In February of 1865, Confederate troops finally vacated the fort. Today, Fort Sumter is a national monument preserved and maintained by the National Park Service. After a short boat ride out to the fort and a brief ranger orientation, you are allowed to take a self-guided tour of Fort Sumter. Displays and artifacts are located around the fort. a mountain howitzer used by Confederates to defend the fort against Union troop landings. Fort Sumter has a museum with displays of artifacts and many other displays with information on the attack and the Civil War. Located across the channel is Fort Maltry. Fort Maltrie is one of the locations used by the Confederates to fire on Fort Sumter. Fort Maltrie's history covers 171 years of seacoast defense, including the first decisive victory in the American Revolution and firing onto Fort Sumter during the first battle of the Civil War. The third Fort Maltrie built in 1809 stands today. By touring the fort, visitors can see how coastal defenses have evolved. The museum at Fort Maltrie has displays on recently recovered Confederate submarine H.L. Hunley. On the opposite side of the channel is Morris Island. Morris Island was the location of Confederate Fort Wagner, attacked by the 54th Massachusetts, an all-black unit commanded by Colonel Shaw and portrayed in the movie Glory. Battery Point is located at the water's edge of the city of Charleston. Confederates also use this location to fire on Fort Sumter. The area has numerous Confederate monuments and displays.
Chapter 8 Patriot's Point The Patriot's Point Naval and Maritime Museum is located in Mount Pleasant at the mouth of the Cooper River on the Charleston Harbor, directly across from Charleston. This is a view of Patriot's Point Naval and Maritime Museum. Patriot's Point is home to four museum ships, the USS Yorktown, CV-10, an aircraft carrier, the U.S. CGC Ingham, WEC-35, a Coast Guard cutter currently closed as of 2009, the USS Laffey, DD-724, a destroyer currently closed as of 2009, and the USS Clamagor, SS-343, a submarine. Until 1994, Patriot's Point also hosted NS Savannah, America's only nuclear merchant vessel. This shows the location of Patriot's Point Naval and Maritime Museum at the mouth of the Cooper River on the Charleston Harbor, directly across from Charleston. This is the USS Yorktown at Patriot's Point. The Yorktown has many exhibits on board, including the Medal of Honor Museum, with biographies of all medal recipients, and 25 naval aircraft, including the A4 Skyhawk, A6 Intrude, A7 Corsai, F4 Phantom, F9 Cloga, and the F14 Tomcat. Exhibits ashore include a Civil War era cannon, and from the Vietnam War era, a U.S. Navy Bell A-1 helicopter, USMC Bell A-1C Cobra helicopter, PBR-105 River Patrol boat, and a naval support camp. This is the USS Yorktown at Patriot's Point. This again is the USS Yorktown at Patriot's Point. This again is the USS Yorktown at Patriot's Point. Chapter 9, The Climate of Charleston Will it be hot? Or will it be cold in Charleston? This is a graph of the average high and low temperatures in Charleston throughout the year. This is a graph of the rainfall in Charleston throughout the year. We see that the rainfall is comparable to the U.S. average, except for the summer months when intense thunderstorms push the rainfall to almost twice the U.S. average. Recommended videos, Charleston. Recommended video, Best Things to Do in Charleston, South Carolina. Recommended video, Charleston, South Carolina, the top 10 places you need to see. Recommended video, Charleston top 10 things to do. Recommended video, Charleston, South Carolina sites. Table of contents, Charleston. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.